It's 11 past 10, DCFM 88.9, and it's a very good morning to the Mayor of Dubbo, Matthew Dickerson. Good morning, Mr Mayor. Good morning, Mr Martin. Very uh, formal today. Well, we are indeed. I mean, after 13 and a half years on council, I still refer to the Mayor as Mr Mayor, <laughs> <laughs> which is what you have to formally do. Uh, interesting committee meetings last night. Firstly, um, we've got to get on to the boiling water situation. What mm -hmm. is happening there? So, boil water alert is still on at the moment. It's an interesting scenario now, Richard. We had water that was below spec produced for the community from 8 a.m. last Thursday, not yesterday, the mm. week before, through to 6, 8 a.m. p.m. So yep. about 10 hours we had water that was below the specification. We've been working with New South Wales Health talking about that. So that might have been seven or at most eight megalitres of water that we put in the system below spec. By 6, 8 a.m. p.m. last Thursday, we had the situation under control. We got water below 0.5 nephilometric turbidity units. <laughs> Not I'm a word I thought I'd have to say to yeah, anyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that, yeah. <laughs> so we had it below 0.5 again, which is where the Australian drinking standards from 2011 say it has to be. For the last week, we've been producing water at that level. So we produced over 100 megalitres of water at the correct specification. We've got about 80 megalitres of storage capacity across our network with the reservoirs that we have in Dubbo. So logically, you'd say, well, that seems like it's all pretty good. It seems like that should be enough water going through the system that surely we could get to the stage where the boil water alert would be lifted. But at this stage, no. New South Wales Health are still saying we want that boil water alert on. We then took the extra step of saying we're going to get our water tested because you don't care so much about the NTUs, the turbidity level mm -hmm. in itself. What you're trying to do is make sure you haven't got any cryptosporidium in your water. Exactly. So we said... Logically, if that's what we're worried about, let's test for that. So we actually engage Sydney Water. We can't do the testing here. Sydney Water are authorised to do the testing. So we engage Sydney Water to do the testing, and there we've had that water sample being taken from various reservoirs, and we'll have the results of that testing by tomorrow morning, Saturday morning. With that information, if there's no cryptosporidium spores in our water reservoirs from that testing, we'll be then talking further to New South Wales Health, although New South Wales Health say... We don't always trust the testing, which is interesting. I'm not quite sure why. The process at the moment is we've really got to work with New South Wales Health yeah. to make sure we get the right answer. But we think at the moment it, we're getting very close to the stage of saying that we are confident with the drinking water going out to the community in Dubbo that it is safe to drink. But again, at the moment, no, it's still boil water mm. alert on until we get that sign off from New South Wales yeah, Health. Look, yeah, f and fair enough. I mean, you've got to be very cautious about course. Uh, 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 Cryptosporidium, because it can make you very, very ill. And when I did my uh, swimming pool manager's course, uh, we looked at a lot of chlorinated water, of course, and keeping water healthy in swimming pools, in public swimming pools. And we looked at the various diseases and things, and it can spread very, very quickly, and it can really uh, knock people around um, if you don't have the right per parts per million chlorine uh, or to go to hydrochlorous acid in the water. So mm. I... Um, very pleased that uh, New South Wales Health are being very cautious about this. Uh, it's, it's wise. Yeah, and you're quite right. If you're an immunocompetent person, oh, I, yeah. I describe you and I, I don't normally talk about you and I like this, Richard, but I describe you and I as immunocompetent people, then if we did actually have uh, an infection for you and I, we would have diarrhoea mm. for a couple of days, maybe a cough. It would be unpleasant. But the concern for me is more people that might be immunocompromised, people that might be frail, they might be vulnerable, they might be, say, in an elderly home or an aged care facility, that type of thing. Those people be, can become a lot worse than have some diarrhoea. It can actually get to the stage where people can die from being infected with crypto. Well, so, I mean, again, from a council perspective, the last thing we want is to have a crypto outbreak, which is why from the very beginning, the very first time we detected the NTU, the turbidity level being above 0.5, we made contact with New South Wales Health and went through a, a process, a protocol to go through all that in the correct way. At the moment where we are now, there's just some different angles, some different calculations being done by our staff, by our consultants, by New South Wales Health to try and get to the point where we all agree that it's right to go forward. Yep, good. And I'm pleased that uh, everybody's erring on the side of caution. Makes, Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, we Last night in the committee meetings, you looked at the Tony Kelly situation. Uh, and you've explained that in the past, that we can't name the whole park after Tony Kelly, but we can certainly name a grandstand. Where are we up to with that? So that will go out on public display. So we've got the Tony Kelly Pavilion is the proposal. 
There's a new amenities block there. There's a new building there. So we're not talking about the rugby clubhouse. That no. won't be changed in its name. But we're talking about that new pavilion that's being constructed there at Number One Oval. The proposal from councillors was to name that the Tony Kelly Pavilion, but only after we go out for a process through public consultation. Part of the reason was that we believe, this council believes, that we really need to make sure we engage the community a lot in our decision-making process, and we feel like that was lost a little bit in the last council, so we want to make sure we re-engage the community again, and that's working very well, and I thank the community for being so engaged. But another part of it was that when the previous proposal was put by the previous council to the Geographical Names Board to rename Victoria Park Number mm. 1 Oval to Tony Kelly Oval, the feedback from the community was more against than it was for, and the Geo Names Board said, no, you can't rename Number 1 Oval to Tony Kelly Oval. So we felt that if we just went and named another part of Number 1 Oval after Tony Kelly with no public consultation, we feel like we were ignoring the feedback that we previously received from the community. So that was very important from our perspective, get that feedback, make sure they're happy. And I suspect that the community will be okay with the pavilion. I agree. But I think part of the reason it wasn't anything against Tony Kelly individually or personally against renaming mm. Victoria Park Number 1 Oval. I think the community felt like there was a lot of history there with Victoria Park Number 1 Oval. So it was more the fact that it was renaming that particular area rather than anything against Tony yeah. Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. For people who don't know Tony Kelly, Tony Kelly was a very, very successful and well-liked general manager of the Dubbo City Council, as it was known in those days. And uh, being a councillor under Tony Kelly, you weren't, but I was. No, no I was. Uh, were you well, there with Tony? Yep, just before he retired. Oh, so maybe eight months there I had oh, Tony. Yeah, yeah. okay. A good bloke. Very, yep. But also, I think what people have missed is that he did his job, and he did his job very well, mm. and he got paid for his job. But people didn't see the work that he did outside his role as general manager, out in the community, out involved with rugby league in this particular city. and Turf club. Turf club, a whole range of things yeah. he did outside that. And so I think that's where people that put his name forward, it wasn't just based on the fact that he did a very successful job as general manager, but also a range of other activities in the community, I think, and that's very important. To and know. he talked to people too, uh, quite extensively at the Macquarie Club <laughs> <laughs> on Fridays. His second office. His second office, it certainly was. Um, getting back to, oh, I've completely forgotten the next question now, <laughs> just thinking about Tony and his consultations <laughs> at the Macquarie Club. Oh dear. Um, so okay. one of the things from the committees last night, I'll help you out here. Yeah, if you like. please, yeah, please do. <laughs> while, while you're reminiscing about Tony, one of the things that I think is very important for the community to know as well is that one of the proposals put through the standing committee meetings last night was a proposal to take some parcels of land in Dubbo that are currently used recreational land or open space and convert those into land that might be used for other purposes, for example, housing. And there's one in particular in Wellington called Market Square mm. that is technically a recreational area, but no organised sport is played there. People might go down and walk their dogs across that area. It's crown land at the moment. The proposal is to convert some of those to operational land and then potentially sell them off to be used for other developments. And it's something that's happening across the state. I've actually had a lot of discussions with other mayors, other councils, where this is a focus that they've got at the moment to try and solve some of the housing problem, crown land that isn't really being utilised or non-operational land that's not really being utilised, just open space land. It's costing the council money to maintain it, not a lot of usage for it. It would it be better off to be used for potentially housing or for other uses? And that one in Market Square is one that I'm very interested in. We've also got some proposals around Dubbo. We agreed last night, but again, it will have to go to the council meeting in two weeks' time to actually go the next step forward. But one of those next step forward is definitely public consultation. So from the community perspective, be assured that we're not about to convert recreational land to operational land and turn it into housing tomorrow. There will be a process that that goes through and a major part of that process is the public consultation process. And yep. some of those will have, for example, 42 days of public consultation, much longer than a normal process, to get the community to have their say about those processes going yeah, forward. Yeah, I agree. And that was my question, actually. <laughs> I can read your mind. <laughs> Thank you. Um, building figures, um, they're looking a bit funny, a bit, a bit ordinary. So building figures are interesting. There was really, when you look back at some of those building figures over the last 12 years or so, there was an absolute boom period mm. around that 2011, 2012, through all about 2016, 2017. And it started to slow down around those next few years. But during the pandemic, it then shot up again. The latest figures as we are for this year, this financial year or the financial year that just finished, shows that those figures are dropping back down a bit to some of those levels 
maybe back to those boom times around 2016, 2015, those sort of years. So it's interesting, there is still that demand there, huge demand there, but a couple of issues that we've identified as we looked at those figures, because you look at the data and then you want to understand what's behind the data. Mm. And when we look at the data, at first thought we go, well, it's actually worse than it has been for the last couple of years. The last couple of years have been absolute boom times, but now it's at the point where there is less land available. That's something that council's trying to address with our own land, but I know developers are trying to address that in Dubbo as well. Builders are very scarce on the ground. It's hard to get a builder at the moment because they're all very busy doing a range of projects, but also building material. Your product, yeah. That is a real challenge for builders as well. So there are builders out there at the moment who have got people who are desperate to build their new home, but they just can't get some of those building materials that they, they need. So it's not as if the bottom has fallen out of those building figures completely, but I would have hoped they would have kept building on the last couple of years during the pandemic. But again, that was always going to be very much a high mark. So it's getting there where it's dropped off a little bit, not any, any cause for major concern yet, but it's just something to keep an eye on. And that's why we feed some of those data points through to council so we can look at that, analyse that. Are we getting it wrong? Are there things we could do that would be better? How can we change what we're doing? Or is it something else outside our control that we just have to say, well, those are the numbers and we accept those? Yep. Yeah. Um Trees around the, around the city at the moment, when, when the drought was on, we lost a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. And so you, so you go along, say, a road, and there's a nice row of trees, and there's a huge gap, and then there's a more, more trees. Um, and it was projected by a previous council, the previous council, those gaps will be filled. Is that going to happen? That will happen, but it all takes time, and it all takes money. And that's an issue, as we've talked about before, that there was a hole left in the budget, the mm. $20.3 million hole we talked about in the last budget from the last council, We've got to get back to the stage where we can at least break even, and that's our objective for this current financial year we're in. We want to try and break even, and then over subsequent years get to the stage where we're filling in some of that hole. Some of those things, like trees, yes, we want to fill in some of those trees, some of that were lost during the drought, but again, there's a process involved there, and it just it takes money, and it takes time, and we can't click our fingers and make these things happen magically. Is but it wise for council at the moment to borrow while interest rates are really low? I mean, they're going up all the time, mm. but... Um, of course, council have a different rate of interest to borrow from. Is it wise that uh, council should borrow, if, despite the debt, um, borrow now while interest rates are low to put those pro get projects such as those and others uh, on track and, and moving now? Absolutely, and that's some of the, the discussion we've had around council is exactly that, that while interest rates are low, take advantage of that, borrow to actually do some of these projects, and we're actually doing that, there's a resolution from council to move forward, for example, in our land development. In the past, the way council and the way most developers develop land was you develop a certain part of, you might own a large mm. parcel, develop a certain part of that, and then you'd sell those blocks, and then you'd develop the next stage, and you'd sell those blocks. So you'd get the money coming in, you didn't have to borrow too much, and you'd just keep that money rolling over. We've actually instructed our staff to go forward and develop much more aggressively, much larger chunks of land, and to do that, we'll have to borrow money. And we're talking about maybe five, ten, twelve million dollars we might need to borrow. Uh, twelve to million dollars for council's nothing. <laughs> oh, come I'm glad on. you say that, Richard. Oh. <laughs> it's nothing it, by comparison. Look, you've got two hundred and fifty three million dollars in uh, restricted assets at the moment, right? Yeah. You've got a huge superannuation fund there. Um, then I mean I, I tried when I was on council to get, get uh, people to borrow against the superannuation fund, but um, no, the conservative elements and the mandarins with the council had horror over that one and uh, fell about all over the place saying no, no, no. And I remember the, pre, the general manager at the time um, going quite red in the face and saying <laughs> no. But look, um, it, it's sensible to me. Yeah, that's right. And that's what we're doing. Again, we want to make sure that when we hand over this council in the next elections that occur in 2024, we want to hand over this council in a better state, both from a financial position, but also from a trust position, from a morale position, from all the key indicators. We want to hand over the council to the next group of councillors that come along in a better state than it is now. Borrowing some money makes sense, and we will do that where it seems appropriate. Borrowing money willy-nilly and running up huge debts is not the best way to hand over the council to the next group of councillors. So we've got to be sensible in that. We've really got to work out each project. And then it comes to borrowing the money as opposed to do we have the staff or are there contractors available to deliver some of the projects? Because there, there is no doubt about it, there is a scarcity of staff both at council level, but for a variety of contractors at the moment, every employer I talk to talks about their number one issue being not being able to get enough staff at the moment. So even if we had unlimited funds right now today, 
getting the ability to get the work done is not always that easy with the ability to actually have people on the ground, feet on the ground. Okay, 26 past 10, very quickly, uh, lane-wise. Which ones in particular? <laughs> well, well, all of them. <laughs> so there was a resolution by council several years ago, I think I'm going back as far as 2020, yep. where there were 10 laneways, walkways, if mm. you like, that were closed off. And that was done via a process, public consultation, that type of thing. For whatever reason, some of those weren't done. And our new CEO, Murray Wood, when he came along, looking at a variety of aspects of council, fixing up things, making sure things were on track, found that some of these laneways that were resolved to be closed off weren't closed off. So we're now starting to close those off. And I've had a bit of feedback from a couple of people in the community who said, oh, no one told me about this laneway, this walkway being closed off. Why wasn't I consulted on yeah, this? Yeah. Well, the community was consulted two and a half years ago, but it should have already happened. So my apologies to the community that they weren't followed through and things weren't occurring. They are happening now. We also have a couple of examples where in some examples, people, rather than just close off a walkway, properties on either side were offered the ability to buy that parcel of land mm -hmm. if they wanted to do it. We're not talking about huge amounts of money. It might have been ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, that kind of number, to buy a little extra sliver of land that might be alongside. So you just extended your backyard, for example, or the side of your house a little bit further. Some people have taken that up, and one actually went through our standing committees last night. So some people have taken that offer up from council. But again, it should have already happened by now, but it just didn't seem to happen. And I suppose we're seeing a bit of that on this council, that the previous CEO just seemed to not always follow through and get things completed in a timely fashion, if I can say that without getting myself in trouble. That's a very, very political statement to finish on. Mayor Matthew Dickerson, good talking with you. We'll catch up after the council meeting and see what goes on there. Thanks, Richard. And it looks as though you've got a busy day. You've got to catch a plane, have you? Got to catch a plane all over the place today. All, all right. Before I catch that plane. And the planes are on time. I just looked at the boy. That's so, bad. I'd like them to be there late, give me more time to do things. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly have. DCFM 88.9. It's 29 past 10 right now.